church, it is so good to see all of you. Let's stand and worship the Lord this morning together as we sing to the King. We pray that as we worship and praise his name, that he would open up the heavens, that his glory would be revealed, that he would draw us closer to himself this morning. Let's sing together. Waited for this day, we're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. And you're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're seen. Before you're seated, I invite you to turn and greet those around you. Let them know you're glad to see them this morning. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jacob Bartu. Um, my wife, Vicki, and I have been had the pleasure of going to Live Church. Now, I think this is our third year. Um, first off, go dogs. Am I right? Yeah. Woo. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So a few announcements before I do our call to worship. Uh, men's Bible study will, their next meeting is November 12th at 8 a.m. here, and they'll be meeting here at Life Church. Um, the churchwide Thanksgiving event um, is going to be November 20th, right after the service. Um, ladies' Night and Ornament Exchange is November 28th at 6 p.m., and they'll be meeting here at Life Church. Um, and then Aaron is in need of some volunteers for Kids Life and Check In and Check Out. Um, so if you're interested in helping out, you can see Aaron and Gavin and Catherine actually are in need of some volunteers for parking, the help with parking too. So if you're interested in helping out with parking, please see Gavin and Catherine Mitchell. All right, so uh, for the call of worship today, I'm going to read from Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 23 through 25. So if you don't mind, if you could stand while I read, if you're able. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inward, inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, now that this is wait, now that this is seen is not hope. For now, for who hopes 
for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. You can be seated. So as we go about our lives over the next few weeks um, and we run to run into adversity or a tough season of life, um, we should just remember that by the time we know a problem exists, um, God already has or he's already been working on it um, and his solution is already on the way. Uh, We must practice with those. We must practice patience with those around us um, and also with God. We must make sure to cost, uh, cast all of our anxieties on him because we, because he tells us that there will be a time when we will see the wise and loving um, point of it all. So, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another uh, beautiful Sunday to come together as a church body and worship you. Lord, we just ask that whenever we are going through our daily struggles, um, that you would remind us to cast all of our worries onto you, Lord, because we know Uh, you already have a solution, and that you have a purpose for us. Lord, I ask that you would speak through Nolan today um, so that we would grow in our special relationship with you. Um, Lord, I ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. If you're able, let's stand again as we sing. As I've been preparing for this Sunday and singing through um, the music for this week, these next two songs have really been ministering to my spirit this week. Um, Just resting in who we are in Christ and in his sufficiency. He is all we need. He gives us breath in our lungs. He wakes us up every day. If all we had was Christ, we'd have everything we needed. Amen. So as we sing through these next two songs, I invite you to just meditate on the goodness of God and who he is and who he's called you to be, his sufficiency and faithfulness. Let's sing these songs together.
one more time if all of you if all of you is all I need take everything yes all yes all of you is all I need take Christ and I have everything. His presence is enough. He hides me in his wings. He wraps me in his love. He stirs my
rest in your faithfulness. We rest in how you sustain us, Father. You're so much more than enough. We stand on that truth, who you are and who you are, who your word says you are. As we take time now to dig into the scripture, to dig into your word, I pray that you would just continue revealing yourself to us in new and special ways this morning. As the Holy Spirit speaks through Pastor Nolan today, speak to our hearts. God, draw us closer to yourself, sanctify us, make us more like Jesus today. It's in his precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Life Church. I seem to have lost my voice because I, I did what Kirby told me to do. Um, just kidding. Just kidding. I did not lose my voice doing what Kirby told me to do. Although I think some of you might have, and uh, if you did, you can just wave at me when you walk. You don't have to speak. You don't have to. You don't have to show your hand. Um, I know why you lost your voice. Okay. Um, but it was an interesting day yesterday. I mean, like, so we won. Um, Clemson lost, Alabama lost, right? So, um, yeah, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Um, uh, what, what a day. So, so as a result of that, we are here to worship God and give thanks for his sovereignty in giving us a favorable day yesterday. Um, but listen, it's great to see y'all. It's a blessing, as always, to come and be a part of this church and what God is doing right here at 120 Rare Street here in Athens, Georgia, uh, it is, it, God's hand is, is all over this place. And, and we thank God for just what he's doing, and it's his doing. And we just sit back and say what the scriptures say, that it's the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. We get to behold his work in his hand and just sit back and say, go, Jesus, go. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm thankful for that. Welcome. Um, for those that are here, you might be visiting or you got an invite to come and or maybe you found us online. For whatever reason you're here, we just want you to feel welcome. I hope you felt it. Um, I hope you know that this is a place where we just love each other. We genuinely do. It's the culture of this church. And, uh, and anything special that, that I've done, it's the Lord and, and it's y'all's heart to say we just love fellowshipping and worshiping together. And that's, that's live church. That's, that's who we are and that's what we engage in. Um, so last week I was a little premature in this announcement, but... It fits today. The church budget is ready, and you can grab a handout on your way out. There is a, uh, a simplified outline of the budget, but also there's a detailed handout if you want the details. And John Murray is going to be out in the foyer, the green shirt, beautiful teal green shirt, and he will give you that handout if you want the details. Um, and this is for our church members, obviously, so take that, review it. What we do is we take it, you take it home for two weeks, look it over, Send any questions you have to us or, or contact Danny. She'll get a hold of leadership. If you got questions about things, let us know. And then in two weeks, we do the good old Southern Baptist thing, and we vote on the budget. And, uh, and after that, we're going to go eat and feast until we can't eat no more uh, across the parking lot. And all are welcome to that. Invite your friends and family. We just, we, we just want to come together and, and fellowship and, and have a great time. So that being said, I am thrilled about where we are headed uh, in this moment this morning. So let me pray and we will press into it. Father, God, thank you once again that you see fit, Lord, to uh, give us the abilities to come here and to be here and engage in worship one more time. Um, God, I just ask that the scriptures would come forth, God, in power and in truth and in clarity from the youngest to the oldest. God, may we feast on the word this morning. God, we need we need sweet relief from on high and you bring that, Father. You bring that by way of your spirit. And Holy Spirit, just oh, flood this place. God, go in and out of the, the seats and the aisles and just really do a work on the hearts of the men and women here this morning. God, we need you. We declare our dependency upon you. God, this is all about you. Lord, if, if, if you are not in this, we are wasting our time and we are operating in vain. But we know you're here. God, we know you're working in this church. And we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for your presence, God. Um, give us what we need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. 
take your Bibles and go to the book of James. The book of James. This is where we are going to be for a while. And y'all know me. Um, we're going to take our time. We ain't got nowhere else to go. Ain't no rush. Uh, but we're going to be in the book of James for a while. We're actually going to break uh, in December. I'm going to do an Advent series um, up through Christmas, and then we're going to jump back into the book of James. It's going to take us to the summer, and after the summer, we'll be in Psalms, and we'll jump back into James. So that's the route that we're taking. But let me give you, uh, let me tee the ball up for us this morning. That The book of James, it is intensely practical, very, very practical in, in nature. There's five chapters in the book of James. There's 108 verses in the book of James. And out of those 108 verses that I've read, and I've looked at, there are 60 imperatives that jump out of the text at us. 60 imperatives. Now, an imperative is just a grammatical word uh, that at, emphasizes uh, importance or just the severity of something that needs to be done. Immediate action. When you see this word, uh, when I say this word imperative, there's some immediate action that has to take place. An example is in verse 5 where it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. Ask God is the imperative. And there are 60 of those that we see within all of the book of James. Now, the theme of the book of James, I'm going to throw out a couple of, of words here. I've used these before, and I'll explain them. But what James is really hitting at is that our orthodoxy, what we believe, what we stand on, our doctrine, our theology, our orthodoxy, needs to be in line with our orthoproxy, which is how we live according to what we say we believe. So James is saying those two have to be in line with each other. You cannot just say this is the orthodoxy that I live upon, but there's no orthoproxy that follows the orthodoxy. So James says these two have to be together. He's saying, I, I want to make sure that our confession matches our conduct. He's saying that faith in Christ produces service to Christ and to his church. That the faith that we have received as a result of being blood-bought by Jesus, it must have evidence that accompanies the faith. That faith is like the medication some of y'all take. Faith has side effects. And he's saying here that this is what is to be produced in the life of the believer. And this is why I've titled this entire series, The Effects of Faith. Because there are byproducts that are meant to show up in our lives as a result of belonging to Jesus. Byproducts that show up in our life as a result of belonging to Jesus. And the, the first side effect that we see that James brings out about himself in chapter 1, verse 1, is this word servant. He says, this is the first side effect that you need to see from me, is that I'm a servant. And I'll dig more into that in just a second here. But here's an overarching statement. If, if the book of James, if that takes root in the lives of you all and in my life, in our life, there will be visible impact on Life Church of Ashland. There will be a visible impact on this church. If we take this book seriously, if we dig into what we're hearing Sunday after Sunday after Sunday from the book of James, there will be a visible impact that lays itself out on the Life Church. Now, it's not going to be easy. Because the, the book of James, what it does, is it, it looks you in the face and says, okay, here's what's about to happen. We're about to put your doctrine on display. That, that's what's about to happen, man to man, woman. Your doctrine is about to be on display. And that orthoproxy, which is the way you live out what you believe, it's going to be well-shaped and well chiseled in the weight room of life. James interacts with the trials and tribulations of life, but he says, in essence, that trial and tribulation is like a weight room, and it's going to build you up. 
And it's not easy if you've been in a weight room. It's not easy to look at those weights and go, man, I really look forward to doing this. Because to build up those, those, those muscles, those spiritual muscles, it means that you can't just walk in, in, in the gym and look at those weights and look at those machines and then walk out and say, I think that's enough for today. And it happens. Like at the gym, people, they look great. They got the gym clothes on. And I've seen people where they go in and then they, they walk around. They're on their phone or they're watching the TV or they're listening to music. They'll walk around for 30 minutes and then leave. And they might feel accomplished, but the truth is that they've not done, done anything. But for Live Church to see some gains, you've got to pick up the weights. You've got to, you've got to pick up James. You've got to bitch press James. You've got to deadlift James. You've got to power clean James. You've got to curl James. You've got to run on James. And when you've been doing that, folks are going to look at you and say, you, you look like you've lost some weight. You've lost some of the weight of anxiety. You've lost some weight of fear. You've lost some weight of worry. Is there anybody that wants to lose that type of weight this morning? And that's what's going to happen when we get in this weight room of life and we lift the word of God. Let me read the the, uh, first one. That's all we're going to get to this morning, Lord willing. Verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in dispersion, or some of your translations might say, which are scattered abroad, greetings. Now, it's always important to to know the context and the background of the text. Some of the books of the Bible, uh, they give us less context, and we have to do a good bit more digging on things like authorship or where the location was or the time frame in which it was written. Uh, But there's one thing that we don't have to guess about this particular book, and that's the fact that somebody named James wrote it. Okay, We, We don't have to guess about that, right? Uh, somebody named James wrote this particular book. So let me, let me explain to you a little bit about this, this James. First of all, there are four individuals in the New Testament named James. Okay? So, so we have to do a little bit of digging and go, okay, through process of elimination, let's figure out who the one guy was, the one James out of the four that actually did write this. So we've got James, who's the brother of John and the son of Zebedee. He's the first apostle who was martyred. And he's actually known as James the Less. If you want to read about him, uh, Matthew 10, 2, Mark 15, 40, and Acts 12, 2. That's not the author of this book, but that's one of the Jameses. Another James was the son of Alphaeus. He was another of the 12 disciples. You can read about him in Matthew 10, verse 3. Well, he's not our guy this morning. There is a James who was the father of the other apostle, Judas, you can read about him in Luke 6, 16, but he's not our guy. But our guy this morning who write, wrote this particular book, uh, biblical research, it, it assigns this book to one called James the Just. This particular James was the half-brother of Jesus. He's the half-brother of Jesus, also the brother of Jude. Now, of James, this James, the half-brother of Jesus, in Matthew 13, 35, it says this. Is Jesus not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? This was a different Judas. So it literally lists James' name as being a brother of Jesus here in Matthew 13, 35. Jude, who was also a half-brother of Jesus, brother of James, he wrote this in Jude, verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So we get some good clues here. We get some good clarity. We actually find out in Acts 15, 13 that James was also a leader of one of the churches in Jerusalem. So we've got James, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, can you imagine for a second if your older brother was Jesus? Just Practically, just just think about it for for just a second. Your older brother is Jesus. Now, I would assume that there was probably some animosity amongst the two of them, maybe because when you talk about the epitome of a goody (laughs) two-shoes, Jesus, right? His his older brother. I mean, if, if the teacher sends word home to Mary and Joseph, hey, one of your kids did really, really great in school today, they're going to say, well, Jesus, 
I mean, the dude is perfect in everything, right? Never makes any mistakes. Get all the gold stars, all the A-pluses, right? It's Jesus in the school of Jerusalem there. It's, it's, it's got to be him. He's perfect. And I can imagine that James was probably very thrilled when he found out that Jesus got in trouble for staying in Jerusalem and not coming back home with Mary and Joseph. He was probably like, yes, he finally got in trouble, <laughs> right? Jesus finally did something. Mr. Perfect got in trouble. And then Jesus was like, woman, I'm about my father's business. And James was like, there he goes again. <laughs> there he goes again. But on a serious note, like, James is there, and he's the brother of Jesus, and, and he's hearing the stuff that Jesus is proclaiming. And he's got to be thinking, like, Jesus, you are, like, crazy. Like, you, you're crazy. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Like, you are out there. You're, you're claiming stuff like being the son of God. I'm, imagine your sibling saying, I'm, I'm the son of God, right? You're, you're saying, me and the father are, are one, and y'all should follow me, and I, I'm going to be raised from the dead. Like, this is crazy. What Jesus is doing is literally embarrassing the family. Like, it's embarrassing. I mean, they, they could probably not go anywhere with people going, hey, hey, look, look, that's, that's James, the, the crazy man Jesus. That's his brother right there. Like, surely this happened everywhere that they went. And on top of the embarrassment of the family, Jesus is literally doing stuff that is not safe. It's not safe for Jesus. It's not safe for the family. I mean, he's bucking against the religious system. He's going against the religious leaders. He's challenging thousands of years of tradition. This is something that you didn't, you didn't do. You weren't supposed to do this, but Jesus was doing this kind of stuff. And in John chapter 7, it tells us this. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee, and he would not go to Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand, and his brothers, literally the brothers of Jesus, they said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples may also see the works you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. They're literally saying, Jesus, go somewhere else. Like, hey, you go there and they'll, they'll, they'll find out who you are. You don't do stuff in secret if you want to be known and open. So, hey, Jesus, man, go, go, get out of here. And then the next verse says, for not even his brothers believed in him. James, Joseph, Simon. Jude, they didn't believe in him. Now listen, I don't doubt that they would have acknowledged some things about Jesus that they were like, mm, that's okay. Like Jesus was doing some good stuff. Right? He, he cared for people. He fed people. He was kind to people. He welcomed in the least and the lost. He shared meals with them. And surely his siblings would have said, you know, that's, that's a very kind characteristic of Jesus. That's fine. We don't have an issue with that. Because at best, they saw what he was doing probably as philanthropic good works. Well, at least Jesus is doing some, some good works, doing some good stuff. But, but even in that, when you think about it today, how many people look at Christianity as a philanthropic good work? Probably a lot of people. They say, you know what, we're okay with it because Christians do some good stuff. They feed the hungry, they clothe the naked, they, they shelter the homeless. You know, they do some good stuff. They'll go out and do community projects and work at Lay Park and get backpacks for kids and provide lunch boxes and all this kind of stuff. You know, like church, they're, they're good because they do some good stuff. So Christianity in nature is philanthropic, so we can tolerate it. But here's a fact. The world will continue to see Christianity in a philanthropic way as long as the church keeps the exclusivity of Christ out of the conversation. They will see the church as a good thing until you start talking about Jesus. More importantly, the exclusivity of Jesus. Then we got a line drawn in the sand. Then we have to say, oh, wait a minute. We were good until Life Church started talking about Christ being the only way to the Father when they start talking about being 
true to the scriptures and the gospel when they start talking about preaching that and, and loving God and making disciples. We were good with y'all life church as soon as y'all talk, talk, started talking about, about that. Because as soon as Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, no man gets to the Father except through me, well, then we have an issue. You've got James having heard all of this conversation about Jesus and seen a lot of the good things that he had done, yet still saying, Jesus, you need to get away from us, and I will not believe in you. And maybe Jesus, he overheard the conversation of Jesus talking about his exclusivity, we know, the, we know for a fact that James was not converted yet during the life of Jesus. So maybe at some point James said, thanks, but no thanks. And a little while later, possibly, if I can take some hermeneutical liberty, possibly James is breaking bread with some friends at some point. Maybe he's in a house and he's eating. And maybe there's a knock on the door and some people come in and they say, hey, James, did you hear about what happened to your brother? No, I hadn't heard it yet. Well, well they arrested him. The Roman guards came and they, they apprehended him and they arrested him and they plan, on, they plan on killing him. And maybe James goes, see, I told you this was going to happen. Like, why couldn't he just be quiet? Why couldn't he just go along to get along? He had a following of people. He was liked by some folks. He did some good stuff. Why couldn't Jesus just, just be quiet and just be nice? I knew this was going to happen. And now he's arrested, and there's no way he's getting out of this. Maybe James hears tell of the trial that ensues. And Jesus is tried, and he's condemned, and he's sent from judgment hall to judgment hall, and he's, he's beat and he's whipped. And he's ultimately placed on this cross right next to the thoroughfare, right outside of the city. And he's there naked and unrecognizable. And then he dies. And then he's laid in this borrowed tomb. And I guess that's the end of my brother. I guess Jesus is done. But I did hear him say something about being raised from the dead. But nah, that's, that's impossible. But he also did say that with me, nothing is impossible. I don't know. Then imagine maybe sometime later, James is out walking in the fields of Jerusalem by himself. He's got to clear his mind. He's got some unrest going on. Just thinking about Jesus. And imagine as James is out by himself, he gets a touch on his shoulder from behind. And James turns around, and it's Jesus. It's Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 tells us that after the resurrection, Jesus appeared appeared to James. And what did Jesus say when he appears to his brother? After the death, after the crucifixion, we know he's died. There's no question about it. Everybody saw it. What does Jesus say to James, the one who rejected him, the one who said, you, you just need to go somewhere else, the one who would not believe in the divinity of Jesus? What does Jesus then say as a resurrected Lord to his brother. Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Jesus had this conversation with a lot of people, and I believe he also had it with James. Now I will remind you, brother, of the gospel I have preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, Unless you believe in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, that I died for your sin, James, and in accordance with the scripture, that I was buried, it just happened, and that I was raised again on the third day in accordance with the scripture. I would imagine the conversation 
was just that. And it's what we see in the text. And what Jesus is doing is he's saying, listen, the scriptures are true, bro. Like I was buried and I was raised again, but you must believe in me because I'm the way, I'm the truth, I am the life. This is how salvation works, and I'm hitting you right in the heart, and I'm asking you, or I'm telling you, or I'm letting you know, your eyes in this moment are being opened to the gospel. This is happening for you, James. I am standing in front of you. And you cannot run away from this. You cannot avoid this. I am right here in front of you telling you, here's the resurrected Savior. Trust in me because the scriptures are true. And from that moment, James is converted. And I think about my own conversion. I think about when Christ opened up my eyes to the gospel. I want you to think about your conversion when Christ came to you. And he comes to you individually. He doesn't just throw out a a, a wide, broad net. He doesn't just save in a group. He comes to you individually and says, you, calls you by name, come out of that grave, come from death to life, and follow me. And this is what he does for James. He calls him by name. He calls him from death to life. He opens his eyes to the resurrected Christ. James is never the same. And as a result of his conversion, James... He becomes a leader of the church. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, James picks up pen and paper, and he begins to write the book of James to the church. And I want you to notice how he introduces himself. James, a servant or bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, James is saved. He's seen the resurrected Jesus. James is ready to go. He's on fire. James is writing verse 1. James was the half-brother of Jesus. He writes verse 1. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if that's me, it'd be hard for me not to write James, the brother of Jesus. (laughs) And the servant of the Lord. But I'm the brother of Jesus, okay? Okay. I'm going I'm to just throw that out there. It might have been a little tough for me not to put that, just insert it in there just a little bit. Because we can even got John, who when he describes himself, he describes himself as the one who Jesus loved. That's how he describes himself. And even Paul, when he's writing the, the, the epistles, Paul introduces himself as an apostle, a servant of the Lord Jesus. But this is James, the brother of Jesus, And all he says about himself is that I am a servant. I am a bond servant. Not just a servant, but a bond servant. See, the word bond servant, it it translates to this ancient Greek word doulos, which is slave. And a slave, a bond servant, that would have been an individual who had a permanent relationship of servitude to their master. To be a doulos or a bond servant, it implies ownership of the slave to his his master. That that bond servant has no rights of their own. None. That bond servant has no will of their own. They have no alternate agenda of their own. It's whatever the master says is what I do. I belong to them. And this is how James describes himself. James is saying, listen, there's no need for me to bring up sibling ties because the gospel supersedes genetics. I don't even need to tell you that I'm the brother of Jesus. It doesn't matter. What matters is I'm a servant of Jesus. And that truly, for us who have been saved by Christ, our eyes have been opened to the gospel, that is the most important thing about us. When you're putting out a resume to somebody, the number one thing on your resume that means the most is servant. That is the most important thing about you, and you all can do some incredible things. You're intelligent. You're smart. God has blessed you with resources. You got, you got credentials, and you got degrees, and you got notoriety and, and legacy and all these things, and that's incredible. But the most important thing about you is none of that. The most important thing about you is not being a mom, being a dad, an auntie, a grandpa, 
It's none of that. It's not being a husband or a wife. The most important thing about you is I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the most significant, important thing about you. I, you know, with sports, I know we don't love Alabama, but you just, Nick Saban, he's, he's Nick Saban. And a lot of the things he says is, well, man, you know some stuff. <laughs> And y'all know one of his famous things here lately is this whole idea of rat poison. Tennessee got some rat poison in them, didn't they? But he says this idea of rat poison is when people are hyping you up and they're saying you're this and that and the other, Saban says that ain't nothing but rat poison. And if you take that rat poison in, it's going to kill you. And I think some of the rat poison that we can sometimes consume in this life is thinking that the exterior things about us are the most important things about us. And they're truly not. To be a servant of Christ, a bond servant of Christ, is the most important. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to break apart this word Lord here for, for a second because this is, this is very important. Um, I've told y'all this before, but I want to explain it again. So from... Old Testament, we see this word Yahweh. And the word Yahweh in Old Testament, Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Some parts of it was written in Aramaic. But when they translated the Old Testament, um, so when they began to translate the New Testament, the Old Testament word Yahweh into the New Testament, it would be translated into Greek. And the word Yahweh translated to the word Kyrios, which meant Lord. So when you see the word Lord in the New Testament, that is the Greek translation of the word Yahweh. So when James says, I am a servant of the Lord, he's saying, I am a servant of Yahweh. And when he's saying this, to say I'm a servant of the Lord, it's not a declaration of devotion necessarily. It's not him just saying that, well, Jesus is my Lord, which is true, but in nature and the translation of the word, James is not necessarily highlighting his devotion to the Lord. What he's highlighting is a statement of fact of the divinity of God. He's saying, I am a servant of Yahweh. And the fact that he associates Lord and Yahweh with Jesus, that's Trinitarian implication. That's saying that Jesus is God. Right. I'm a servant of this Jesus who is also Yahweh and that Yahweh that I serve, that Yahweh that I submit to, that Yahweh as a statement of fact, it's the same Yahweh that spoke the world into existence. It's the same Yahweh that parted the Red Sea. It's the same Yahweh that gave us this foreshadowing of a redeemer that was to come. And in Matthew, we see this genealogy that is expressed. And it's that same Yahweh who is Jesus Christ the Lord, who's the same one who lived a sinless life, who made a way for me to come and be redeemed by his blood, who was crucified and was resurrected on the third day and is coming back as our liberating king with a robe dipped in blood. That Yahweh, that Lord, that Jesus is the one who I submit to. It's a statement of fact. James said, I want y'all to know who we're dealing with here. It's Jesus. It's Yahweh. It's profound. In verse 1. Verse 1, part B. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Now, simple explanation for this. Uh, in the Old Testament, there are twelve tribes that are, are highlighted. Jacob has twelve sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulon, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Joseph, and Benjamin. Uh, you could study about those in Genesis 49, Genesis 50, Exodus 1. But they're, they're the 12 tribes that, that exist. Now, when the 12 tribes are mentioned in the New Testament, it's really more nostalgic than anything. Because at this point, those tribes would have not still been intact. Uh, we're talking hundreds of years uh, even thousands of years in, in between the full establishment of the 12 tribes versus where they're talking now in the New Testament where James is talking about. So when they say the 12 tribes, it's really more of a connection to their relationship to God of reminding them that we are God's chosen people. 
We got history with God. So they would bring up this just to remind each other that, hey, this is where we came from. Like, God has called us and put his hand on us. And so when we say the 12 tribes, it's more like Mufasa talking to his son, remember who you are, right? <laughs> that's, that's really what it's more about. And even you see in, um, in Acts 26 where uh, Paul is before King Agrippa, he references the 12 tribes. And at this particular point in time, uh, Jewish people would have been scattered across the nation. Uh, Christian Jews, and so there would have been remnants of, of just of that history throughout the region, and so when he says that they've been scattered throughout the world, that's what he's, he's talking about, and even we see in Acts chapter 8 where the church is, is scattered, and this is a church under the headship of, of Jesus, right? We see this day of Pentecost come, and all these folks are saved, and the church is established, and they get scattered out. He's even talking to them. They've been dispersed. They've been scattered. But James is essentially saying, listen, I got something to tell y'all. And all that I just explained in this sermon beforehand, orthodoxy, orthoproxy, James is saying, y'all need to get this. The people of God need to get this. And since he's writing to the people of God, it also applies to us today. Some argue and dispute saying, well, this was written only to the Jews. But James is making a case to the church. And so it includes us this morning. As I finish this text, this verse 1, um, James is servant of God and of the Lord Jesus. Simple question this morning. Are you a servant of the Lord Jesus? Are you a servant? Not just a servant, but a bond servant. Have you relinquished the rights or any idea of having rights? Because the truth is, you don't own anything. You can't control anything anyway. But have you at least let go of the idea of control? Say, God, you, you control all things. God, I trust you in all things. I acknowledge my inabilities that I can't do this on my own. God, I don't know how to be a mom to these kids, be a dad to these kids, be a husband to my wife or a wife to my husband. God, I... I'm a bond servant to you, so you you control it. You navigate the way. You know, if we like the title of servant Christ, but we're not serving Christ, we're not a servant of Christ. We have to serve We live that out by serving one another. But it's for the cause of Christ, right? It's not just philanthropic work that we're doing. But we're doing it from our heavenly motive, from our scriptural motive to love God, love people, and to make disciples. But God, he doesn't leave serving as an option on the table. And I I love this church because the majority of our church serves our church but it still has to be said that the culmination of your spiritual walk at life church is not this it's not just to come here and sit and soak and this is fabulous this is wonderful but you're not supposed to just be a spiritual tick i said that before right where we get all good and fat and we wallow up out of here no the purpose is for you to be squeezed we want you to serve. We want you to connect. When we give those announcements and say, hey, we need help here and there and wherever, if you got the freedom and the capacity to do it, do it. We need you. The Lord needs you. He's called us to this. There are effects that faith in Christ produces. And James begins the entire five chapters, 108 verses, by telling you the thesis statement that guides the rest of his writing. I am a servant. When James surrenders to the resurrected Jesus, he does it with full devotion, fully committed. Not halfway committed, fully committed. There's early history of the church and 
they said that, that James would actually spend so much time in prayer on his knees that he'd actually develop these calluses on his knees that would look like camel knees. The amount of time that he spent in prayer. It's also said that James was, was martyred in Jerusalem and he was at the temple and they pushed him off the wall of the temple. But he actually doesn't die from the fall. He dies from the people at the bottom beating him to death. And it said that even while that was happening, James was still praying for those who were killing him. So James could do that because he encounters the resurrected Jesus. And it wasn't about his brother anymore. It was this is the Son of God. He is who he said he was. And those of us that believe that, and God has caused us to come to know that through the word, man, our lives have to look different. They have to. And if you don't know Christ this morning, man, to stop and to surrender to him, to submit to his lordship, to stop running, to stop trying to control everything, to say, God, I just submit to your lordship. You're Yahweh, the same one who spoke the world into existence. And I get to submit to that God because he cares enough for me to send his only son to do for me what I couldn't do for myself. That's what surrender looks like. So if you'd stand with me this morning, I'm just going to pray and the word of God is so rich, it's, it's so full, there's so much depth to it. And I don't know where you're at in your walk this morning. I don't know if you find yourself really struggling deeply this morning, if you just got some looming things on your heart and your head that are just troubling you. I don't know if you're at a place where you're like, yes, Jesus, I'm, all, I'm ready to go, like, bring it on. You might be in a place to where you're just trying to navigate some decisions. You're at a place to where you feel like you're in a situation and you're the only one there and everybody else is doing everything right, but you're the only one that's struggling. Jesus wants to meet you right where you are today, right where you are. The tears that you cried over the weekend and over the past week, he saw them. And he's just letting you know this morning that he cares for you. He just wants you to remind you this morning that if you're in him, you're covered. Keep being a bond servant. Keep relinquishing your rights. Say, God, you own me. You control me. You navigate my Surrender to you, God. Help. Help me. And he will. Father, thank you so much for the text this morning. God, thank you for the book of James that we get to dig in it. God, thank you that your word is forever settled in the heavens. God, there's nothing that can come and thwart what you have established, God. Not a single thing. Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice. I thank you for being curious for being Yahweh. And I ask your blessing on your people this morning, God, as we leave this place, but never your presence, God. May you go with us. You've already gone before us, Lord. Help us to have the continual reminder and remind ourselves of your faithfulness, God. You've been so, so good to us. And help us remember in the trials of life, in the weight room of life, God, that those weights serve a purpose. They're going to produce something in us that can only come through the trial. So God, grant us that reminder. Help us to know and remember that nothing else matters, God. Your presence is what we need, God. You are who we're after, and you're not elusive, God. You're not playing hide-and-go-seek. God, you're right there, right in front of us, because you tell us that when we seek you, we will find you. So that's what we rest on this morning, God. We love you. Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Let's sing this song together.
Father, let that be our hearts, God. Nothing else will satisfy. Nothing else will soothe. Nothing else brings peace. And being a servant and a follower of you, Father, just walking in your wisdom, walking in your guidance, pray that you would be with us as we go as to walk in the truth of who you've called us to be as followers of Christ. Help us to be more like Jesus as we go. It's in his name we pray. Amen.